Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm sure there'll be still some people um, coming in uh, as we go forward. Uh, again, welcome to our Zoominar, uh, Punishment and Prisons, Dungeons and Dark Tourism. My name is Elizabeth Drummond, Chair of the History Department. Uh, and this is a, a continuation of our now virtual programming or digital programming. Uh, we uh, have prided ourselves in the history department on having a robust series of events. And when we shifted online in the spring, we also shifted our programming online, first on social media uh, and then using YouTube videos uh, and doing interviews. And now this fall semester with some live uh, webinars that we're also recording and we'll put up on the YouTube link. We call our space uh, in the history department a village. And even though we're not there right now, uh, we are in, or at least are trying to still be uh, a village and an intellectual community and to share ideas uh, and, and talk about important topics of uh, historical significance. And I'm very excited uh, about today's uh, program on prison history and the history of, of punishment and discipline. And uh, to turn things, to get things started, I am going to turn things over to my colleague, Professor Tony Perrin, who is a historian of medieval Europe here, uh, and he's going to interview, introduce our, our speakers and then get us started. Tony? Uh, thank you. Um, welcome everyone to the program today, which is, uh, of course, if you've seen the flyer, a conversation on the subject of punishment in prisons, dungeons, and dark tourism. Uh, this event is one in an ongoing series uh, hosted by the History Department called History Matters, where we take events of concern in the world around us today and explore their deeper roots and development over time. Um, our History Matters theme this semester was chosen to coincide with the Bellarmine Forum, which is a set of linked courses, lectures, and events hosted by LMU's College of Liberal Arts uh, to highlight the life of the mind and its relevance to modern society. The focus of the 2020-2021 Bellarmine Forum is transformative justice, uh, and one theme of that is, of course, incarceration. For that reason, we wanted to invite some scholars to the History Department to consider the roles uh, assumed by prisons in societies of the past, both near and distant. Um, how have modern systems of incarceration emerged out of earlier forms of punishment and in what ways might jails have been used and interpreted in different ways in previous times? So to explore these questions, we've invited two scholars to join us today, and we uh, want to offer uh, deep thanks to, to both of them for, uh, for coming. Um, each of them will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes um, at the outset, um, and after that, we'll turn it over to questions from all of you uh, in, the, uh, in the audience. And it looks like we have a good turnout today, so I'm hoping for a lively conversation. Um, just a reminder, again, that this is a Zoom webinar, not a meeting, um, which means that while you you can see us, uh, we can't see or hear you. So if you want to ask a question, um, please do put it into the, uh, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the chat is also enabled uh, for, this, uh, for this event in case presenters or facilitators uh, want to post a link or send a message to everyone. Uh, but I do think it'll be easier for questions, at least if you put those in the Q&A, uh, not, uh, not in the chat. So uh, I'm going to introduce um, our speakers one after the other, and then after I introduce them, they'll get again 10 or 15 minutes to uh, to say a little bit, um, and then, um, as I said earlier, we'll uh, we'll open it up for questions. Um, our first guest today is uh, Sarah Butler, who is professor of history and holder of the King George III Chair in British History at the Ohio State University. Professor Butler has a PhD from Dalhousie University, and her research ranges widely over the social history of law in late medieval Europe. She's the author of three books, The Language of Abuse, uh, Marital Violence in Late Medieval uh, England from 2007, um, Divorce in Medieval England from One to Two Persons at Law in 2013, and Forensic Medicine and Death Investigation in Medieval England from 2015. Uh, she's also written a number of important articles on subjects such as suicide verdicts in 13th uh, and 14th century Britain, and just last year, juries of matrons and English common law. 
Finally, Professor Butler is editor and frequent contributor to the Legal History Miscellany blog, which features posts on the history of crime, law, and justice. I really encourage you to, to check it out. Uh, it has a lot of great, uh, a, a lot of great posts. Um, there, among other topics, she's re recently written about jails in later medieval England. So I'll turn it over to Professor Butler, and then uh, we'll turn to our second speaker. Um, hello. So just one moment while I figure out how to put on my PowerPoint. Um, sorry, one second slideshow there. Can you see the PowerPoint? Uh, yes, we can. You just need to start it um, from the beginning. So from start beginning. the slide. Oh, there. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me here to speak. Um, I'm always delighted to come and talk on what I think is one of my favorite topics. Um, I like to call it the barbarization of the Middle Ages. Um, and this is, you know, essentially um, taking a look at the Middle Ages and seeing the worst in it, you know, assuming that the Middle Ages was an era of violence and repression in which the state punished really harshly some of the slightest offenses. I mean, certainly the image that we often get is if you steal bread in the Middle Ages, it's going to lead to you being thrown into a dungeon to rot. This image of the barbarous Middle Ages, I think, is driven largely by Hollywood um, and Hollywood's dark imagination where you actually, I think, very often see the term medieval being a synonym for brutal or barbaric. Um, but it hasn't really been helped that much by the latest fad, which is torture museums. I suspect you've all ended up at one of these at some point in time. The one in Amsterdam, by the way, is totally weird and awesome. Um, this image is from the Medieval Torture Museum in, of all places, St. Augustine, Florida. This one has the best website, by the way. Uh, the website for the museum promises to transport you back in time to some of the most miserable moments in human history. The medieval torture collection reminds us of just how much suffering humanity can inflict in the name of cause and justice when the right tools are placed in the hands of fanatics, madmen, and tyrants. That gives us a, a pretty definite view of the Middle Ages that is not all that positive. Well, I think this stuff actually matters. And part of the reason why I argue this, um, I don't know how many of you have read Steven Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. Um, he really buys into this, some of this attitude about the Middle Ages and is working hard to disseminate this idea out there. Um, this is an exceedingly popular book. It's apparently Bill Gates' favorite book and Mark Zuckerberg's favorite, favorite book. Um, but in this book, he adopts this idea of the Middle Ages as a truly horrific period in order to argue that somehow the human spirit has been civilized over time, that empathy is something we had to be taught, that empathy is not natural to humans. And for anyone who, who has read his work, I mean, it's, it's a bold thesis. He makes it sound like, you know, empathy is, is a muscle that we needed to learn how to use and exercise regularly before it would actually function properly. That gives us a pretty disturbing view, not only of the medieval world, but honestly of human nature. Well, that's why it's important to highlight that medieval experience was actually not as barbarous as our imaginations would lead us to believe, which is why I'm actually gonna start with the worst today, executions. Um, I think it is important to point out that if any of you are fans of Game of Thrones, you have actually seen more medieval executions than most medieval people did. These were fairly rare occasions in the Middle Ages, uh, despite everything that we hear. And most people had no interest in going to them whatsoever. Uh, Henry Summerson has described them as rather hole in the wall affairs. Uh, people had to be cajoled and, and dragged essentially to attend executions because they didn't want to go. So the booing and jeering and fruit throwing um, that we would see in the movies is completely inaccurate. Um, 
there aren't a ton of statistics out there that historians have put together in executions, but we do have a few. And again, I think they do a good job of emphasizing that executions were nowhere near as common as we think they might have been. So the Parliament of Paris, for example, between the years 1387 and 1400, dealt with 200 um, cases that could have ended in capital punishment. Only four of them did. In the city of Arras, which is in northern France today, but would have been the Low Countries in the 15th century, it had an average of one execution per year. So I think that's important for us to recognize. Um, these were not necessarily as um, horrific and as much of a part of daily life as I think we are often led to believe by a lot of the popular history that is out there. Now, having said that, you know, most of them were also quite boring hangings, unlike decapitations and so forth that you see. Um, I do want to say, I mean, that doesn't mean that the medieval world couldn't be violent when it comes to this stuff. I'm sure many of you have suffered through Braveheart in the name of enjoying a film with your parents at some point in time. Well, that tells the story of William Wallace, who was a Scottish we have to put traitor in quotes, to the English crown. And when he was captured and convicted of treason, he certainly got the absolute worst that the, the whole era could come up with. He was drawn to the site of execution, disemboweled, his bowels were burnt in front of his eyes, hanged, decapitated, quartered, which means having each limb tied to a horse and the horse is sent in other directions. And then all of his body parts were displayed in five different locations throughout England as a warning to everybody else. This is terrible. And this is often what people assume was the norm in the Middle Ages. However, I should point out, this is because it was treason. The crown had to make an example of people like this. Not that I'm justifying it, but this is their reasoning. Um, and what we discover is there's only about a handful of these from a 500 year period. So this is far from representing the norm. Now, if execution in the Middle Ages was not necessarily as spect spectacular or as frightening for the most part as Hollywood would have us to believe. I think that I need to emphasize this is also true of medieval imprisonment. Um, in general, I should say prison sentences were very short in the Middle Ages. Um, they thought it was a really terrible punishment to leave a person in prison for a long time. So most prison sentences were a couple of days, a week, maybe a month. Um, and for most prisoners, they were actually not there um, on a sentence. They were there awaiting trial. So they weren't convicted felons. They were waiting for their trials to pop up. Some of them did get bail. However, just like it is today, bail is something that was really available for rich people. The vast majority of people could not afford it. And it's fair to say that, you know, prisons were unpleasant places, but they didn't expect it to be pleasant. Um, it was supposed to be a form of purgatory. You were supposed to sit in prison, think about how miserable you were, so that after your few days of sitting in there, you could come before the courts, have your trial, and then they'd say, look, this guy, he is clearly very sorry after all that time he's had sitting in prison thinking about what he's done. We don't need to convict him. But having said that, I think actually the greatest hardship of prison in this period was the expense, which is something we don't think about so much. Um, prisons in the medieval period were very much in private hands and they were run as a business. Um, I put an image of Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow Mass Incarceration, The Age of Colorblindness up here because it was reading that book for the first time that I realized actually there are lots of resonances with what's going on in the U.S. because putting prisons in private hands is often kind of a normal thing in America. Um, and as her study demonstrated, demonstrates, it's a terrible idea to let prisoners out. Fewer prisoners means less money. Prisoners are people who can do work for you and you can get paid as a result of it. Plus the government will pay you money for um, supplying them with everything they need. And if you can get it cheaply, you just pocket some of that. So prison as a business is, is disastrous. 
And honestly, the Middle Ages demonstrate this best. Um, we have a fee schedule for the Fleet Prison in London hanging around, and it gives us a really good indication of all of the various fees that were charged to prisoners in this period. Because the expectation was that the government shouldn't have to pay for criminals to sit in prison. Prisoners should pay for themselves. Now, I, I put this little map up here just so that you know what everything stands for, shilling, pennies, and how much everything is worth. But just to highlight, there were entry fees. I have to thank the prison for allowing me to come stay. So I pay to get into the prison. Um, upon arrival, there's a celebration that I have arrived in prison. So I have to tip the chamberlain, the porter, the jailer. This is essentially buying rounds of beer for everybody. There are bonds for good behavior. You're promising that you're going to be good while you're in prison. And this is a serious one because jailers in this period did not carry weapons. They felt it would be very dangerous to have weapons around prisoners. Um, so rather than create any problems, they just said, you are only ever going to carry a weapon if there's a fear that somebody might be ready to escape and that person has to be kept in chains. But in general, nobody's carrying weapons. So they expect everyone to live up to their word if they promise to be well behaved. Um, accommodations in prisons vary dramatically depending on your, your wealth and what you could afford. So if you were you know, in, able to afford the Baron's Ward, as it was called somewhat ostentatiously, it was a fair amount of money. But you had the use of a parlor, you had manservants to serve you dinner, it all worked quite nicely compared to the beggar's ward where sure you didn't pay anything, but you also didn't get a bed. You just got straw thrown on the floor. Um, meals cost money as well. They were exorbitantly priced so that most people did not buy meals from the prison and many prisons actually stopped carrying meals. Instead, people relied on their family members to bring meal into the prison for them every day or they went begging. If you wanted light in prison, you paid for it. If you wanted to go abroad, i.e. go out for the afternoon and work at your job so you could make money to afford some of this, you paid for it. If you didn't want to wear chains, you paid for it. And when you want to leave, you also paid for it. I think as you can probably see, the greatest problem with prison in the Middle Ages is quite simply, it's hard to leave because you may find yourself so in debt while you're in prison that you can't afford to get out. Um, and a lot of charity went towards helping people with this problem in the period. Now, one of the things that I want to really emphasize about medieval prisons is that they were all centrally located. Um, I'm trying to show you Newgate Prison here. I realized after I put this together, it looks like an explosion. That's not the point. I'm just trying to show you that it's in the center of old London. The point of medieval prisons was they wanted people to be able to go in and out of it on a daily basis so that everybody in town knew what was going on. The point was that kept jail jailers and prison wardens honest. It meant that prisoners had to be well kept because otherwise everybody would know about it and they would hold the prison warden responsible. This is a far cry from the way we do things today. Today we tend to take prisons and hide them away from society so that nobody can figure out what's going on with them. And if you want to visit somebody, you get to see a visiting room. You don't see the jail cells. They would have been very upset about that in the Middle Ages, and they would have risen up against it because they knew that only bad things happen in private. And they were right because the only bad things that happen in private in the Middle Ages tended to be torture. And I'll wind up with this. Um, I want to emphasize that torture in the Middle Ages was not a punishment as it is often perceived to be. Instead, it was a means of extracting a confession. And everybody was actually pretty nervous about it. And because they were nervous about its implementation, they made sure that it was that its usage was extremely limited by regulations. You know, they had to prove that a crime had actually been committed. You can't just have your neighbor 
tortured because you want him to be. It had to be a serious crime, not petty theft or anything like that. There had to be good reason to believe that the person had actually committed the crime. So there should be at least one eyewitness, which is almost enough for a conviction. And tons of people were exempt, including for those who are present, professors, which always makes me feel better. Some other rules, torture cannot be savage. It cannot cause permanent injury. Um, in particular, a lot of this was administered by clergymen who could not shed blood. This is why you get a lot of stretching punishments, which dislocate limbs and that certainly hurts, but it doesn't cause any long-term damage. They also made sure that people um, were present to keep this whole thing honest. And probably one of the most important things here is if you do make a confession under torture, it's not valid. It's only valid if a day later, when you are no longer being tortured, you still stand by it because they worried that this could go sadly astray. So again, um, this does not necessarily give the rosiest image of the Middle Ages. But I think this gives us a good suggestion that a lot of this was nowhere near as bad as we think that it could have been. For example, the fact that um, honest people of good reputation were exempt from torture tells us that they were really trying to reserve the worst that the system could dole out for some of the worst kind of people. And I'll leave things there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Looking forward to questions on, 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 on medieval uh, imprisonment. Um, our second speaker today is Samantha Hunter, who is the Senior Specialist of School and Youth Programs at Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site in Philadelphia, once the most famous and innovative prison in the world and home to such high profile inmates as Al Capone. She has an MA from Villanova University in public history. In her five years with the historic site, Ms. Hunter has developed several innovative social and um, criminal justice educational programs for young learners, as well as many professional development workshops for teachers in the school district of Philadelphia. She's currently co-teaching a course on social impact with high school sophomores and is continuing to build a virtual classroom program. So I'll turn it over to her now. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. So I am going to be telling you a little bit about Eastern State um, and how Eastern State was built to be a humane alternative to the carceral spaces of the time, and then how we as a historic site, as a museum, tell the penitentiary's complicated history. So I, too, am going to share my screen. Here we go. Great. Okay. So Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site is located in the Museum District of Philadelphia, but originally the prison was built on the outskirts of town on an abandoned orchard called Cherry Hill. Eastern State was built on about 10 and a half acres of land and was made to resemble a medieval castle or fortress as a form of intimidation. So um, this is like hearkening back to Professor Butler's point, um, how much perception matters. <laughs> um, I was like furiously taking notes because because here we have it in Philadelphia in a brand new nation. We're talking um, 1820s, this idea of medieval times still being terrifying and torturous. Um, the prison opened in 1829 and was active for 142 years before closing its doors for good in um, 1971. Um, over 85,000 men, women, and children were incarcerated at Eastern State, and we as a historic site do our best to tell those stories with as much nuance and honesty as possible. So for instance, something that we work hard to do is talk about the racial disparity that existed at Eastern State and connect that to the various racial disparities that we see inside of prisons today. All of the work that we do, all of the history we discuss, we make sure to make contemporary connections. That's really important um, in, in my personal perspective as a museum. Um, for us talking about history, what's really important, why people pay money is, is to, to learn about that, but also how they can take action and do things today in their own life. Um, Eastern State Penitentiary was truly the, the first of its kind, um, a prison operating on the core concepts of remorse, rehabilitation, and redemption. 
The seeds of the penitentiary were planted and percolated by famous Philadelphians like Benjamin Franklin and Benjamin Rush. Um, Benjamin Rush is often considered the father of modern psychiatry, and he actually famously kept his son in solitary confinement for a few years. Um, that will play a part into Eastern States history. Um, now, these men were members of a prison reform group known as the Philadelphia Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisons. Um, I really love how back then they called groups as they saw them. Um, who cares if it's an <laughs> incredibly long name, as long as it really gets to the point. I, I love that so much. Um, this group actually still exists today, now with the name of the Pennsylvania Pris Prison Society. So clearly, they, they learned a little bit about the, the name length. Um, the society members, many of whom we would consider founding fathers of Philadelphia, felt strongly that the justice system of this brand new nation needed to reflect the values of freedom and independence. They believed in a system that advocated for second chances and trusted the power of the individual. And jails, at least in Philadelphia and the United States at that time, were really anything but. Um, so like Professor Butler talked about, this here is an illustration of the Newgate prison. And um, I really loved Professor Butler, your interpretation here. Ours is a little different. <laughs> um, so Newgate is a good um, representation, at least of this illustration, of what jails were like in Philadelphia before Eastern State. Typically an overcrowded one room jail house with um, little to no provisions provided. Um, we saw there the, the price for things. Um, so that was definitely true in Philadelphia. Um, usually, Jails were holding cells for folks to wait for their trial, where in many cases they would then receive a corporal physical punishment like what we see happening here. And this was done in public. So um, how different than the medieval times, right? We can see kind of this evolution over time for things being more public. Um, and there's a point to this. There's a point that this punishment um, outside in the public is doing. So it's meant to be painful, right? Hanging out in the pillory, being whipped, all very painful in the moment. But there's also a, another layer, which is humiliation and shame. Um, this was meant to be like a long lasting consequence as a way to deter people from committing crime again. If they had this um, like shame, this scarlet letter that they would wear, um, then of course they wouldn't want to do something like that again. Um, Eastern State was a response to the system built to be the humane alternative. So how exactly did it work? The founders asked themselves this question, which I'm going to ask to you now. Um, you can write responses if you'd like, or you can just kind of sit and chew with it. So the question is, what do you believe a person needs to make a successful change? That's what these founders really sat and thought about. If this is supposed to be legitimate, if we're building this prison, if we're going to do it, how do we do it? So the founders took a micro and macro approach. Micro, um, the individual, focusing on the independent work and journey a person needed to, com to, um, to be completely repentant, um, to seek forgiveness, and to do or be better. Um, macro, the institution. What did the prison need to provide to those folks to make that personal journey successful? Um, for the founders, the answer to both approaches was solitary confinement. The genesis of this highly controversial practice, still used today, began at Eastern State um, in the United States. Um, complete isolation was meant to provide Eastern State prisoners with an opportunity to focus on themselves outside of potential negative influences of their family, friends, and other prisoners. Um, this was an incredibly controversial decision. Scholars and healthcare professionals like Benjamin Rush believed that there were genuine benefits of solitary confinement um, mentally with personal growth and, uh, growth and even physically. Um, there were also the same healthcare professionals and scholars that said the exact opposite. Um, thinking back to that illustration of Newgate I, so, I showed, um, there were so many people in that one space. Um, jails and prisons back then could have a hundred or more people that in there at one time. And considering the time period we're in now, the reason why we're having this Zoom in R, um, disease is gonna run rampant through places like this. So um, the folks who 
believe in solitary confinement felt that um, that was one way of kind of stopping the disease from spreading, which is something we hear echoes of right now. Um, I think that San Quentin um, had a, a lot of controversy, a lot of um, news coming out of that uh, prison because of how they've been handling the pandemic, using solitary confinement, not using solitary confinement. So controversial in so many different ways. Um, I'm also gonna show you a um, talk a little bit about the the cells here what eastern state was like um i do have a video i am going to apologize ahead of time um my work partner and i are not professional filmmakers so there's much to be desired in this uh video here but this is inside of a cell so um the picture there on the left shows you what a typical eastern state cell would have had um, inside in the beginning in the 19th century when the prison opened so you get a bed with a mattress blankets you get a uniform um, across the room from the bed is a workbench where they have shoe making materials prisoners then were making shoes they were weaving baskets they were dyeing cloth um, that gets even more sophisticated over time um, working and uh, solitary confinement were a big part of this redemption arc for eastern state and um, um, something else, meeting a person's basic necessities so that they can focus on this individual personal journey. So um, prisoners here were fed three times a day, whether they could afford it or not. Um, also, you can see a toilet um, in the foreground there on the left. Eastern State was the first public building in the United States to have indoor plumbing and central heat, even before the White House. So when Eastern State opens in October of 1829, Charles Williams, first prisoner, has his very own flush toilet while President Andrew Jackson does not. Um, so I find that fascinating. Now, if your thumbnails are um, in front of the video, you can move that. Um, this video shows what we allow visitors to the historic site to do um, when they get inside, just to enter a cell to really get the feel of it. But what you can see inside, and I'll play the video in just a moment, is how um, high the ceilings are inside of the cell. Um, it was meant to, to feel a little bit like a church or a monastery, meant to be kind of inspirational on this journey of um, self-betterment. I'm going to turn the volume down on this too. All right. So one of kind of the, the primitive toilets there. Um, this would have been just straight white walls, um, stone and brick, natural fireproofing, um, though fire still did start. Um, that skylight was a person's only source of light um, inside the cell for a very long time. Um, here in Philadelphia, things get pretty dark around five o'clock in the winter. So um, cells were pretty dark. Things were kind of difficult here. Electricity doesn't come to Eastern State until the turn of the 20th century. Um, all right, so that's getting a little bit of what Eastern State looks like, what a prisoner would have seen upon entrance, and how the prison originally operated. So then the question is, how do we tell the story of Eastern State? Um, honestly, I have a complicated job. Um, how can we tell 100, nearly 150 years worth of history and over 85,000 unique stories and lived experiences in a 60 minute guided program, which is something that I usually do, or in a small on-site exhibit? It is hard. So um, the starting point for us, recognizing that Eastern state and um, other prisons are sites of trauma. People process trauma in so many different ways. Uh, it can be acceptance, inquiry, laughter, avoidance, and we need to make space for all of those responses. It can be hard, especially when something like prison reform, criminal justice reform means a lot to you, or if um, one of our educators might have personal lived experience being incarcerated or family members who are incarcerated. I, that can be hard, separating the, the personal from the professional. Um, 
Eastern state educators participate in difficult conversation, uh, conversations about incarceration every day. Um, it's not fair for us to expect visitors to be as practiced or as well versed in this issue as we are. So we work to make sure all of our programming meets our visitors where um, they are coming from. Our educators have been expertly trained in dialogue facilitation by the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. As such an emotionally charged site of trauma, our educational programming has the responsibility to to safely or as safe as possible guide visitors through these hard conversations. So through the sites of conscious, their training is something called the arc of dialogue. Um, creating a bridge or this arc um, of dialogic questioning begins with building community, it begins with people sharing a little bit about themselves, and then gets folks to think outside of their self, their own experiences, and start to consider, well, this is how I feel. How might someone else respond to that? How might some other person's lived experience um, change the way that they feel about the prison system? And then finally, um, the arc of dialogue requires um, Eastern state educators to give folks an opportunity to really think on everything that they've learned, talked about, and then to create action. So action for us can be telling somebody about their experience, can be looking up an article on the Washington Post. It could be getting involved in one of the various criminal justice reform organizations. Um, it really runs the gambit, but all are welcome and we try to do all. Um, now, <laughs> we do all of this and we operate uh, a massive top ranked haunted house inside the, the walls of the penitentiary every year. Not this year though. Um, this haunted house called Tear Behind the Walls is uh, the historic site's biggest fundraiser. And let me tell you, we are really feeling the effects of not having it right now. Um, Along with the Haunted House, um, Eastern State has also been featured on a lot of ghost hunting shows. Um, a colleague of mine gave Jack Osborne a tour for his show on the Sci-Fi Channel last year. And there was one moment when I was watching and I swear I watched my coworker's soul just leave his body as the, the ghost hunter said that they had an, a certain experience. Um, so, you know, you have that happening. You have this haunted house where people literally dress up as prisoners or um, as the SWAT team there, the, the folks in the guard uniform. Um, two very different competing missions, competing narratives, which makes honestly my job even harder. But um, it's a challenge that our educators meet every day. Um, and I would say that they're pretty good at it. Um, it takes a lot of patience, um, patience, divorcing the, the personal from the professional, but um, there is a balance in edutainment and in, in, you know, having fundraisers for historic sites. And we try to walk that line as best we can. So um, I don't know if any of you have been to Eastern State before, but if you haven't, I hope that you do get a chance to visit. We are currently open. We are about to just expand our operating hours to be five days a week. So if you ever find yourself in Philadelphia, um, come for a visit. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Great. Great. Well, thank you to both our speakers. This is the point at which, of course, we would give them a great round of applause, which is one of the things we can't do, uh, unfortunately, on uh, on Zoom. So we're all applauding in our uh, in our in our our own little homes here. Um, so, um, as Professor Drummond put in the chat box, if uh, if any of you have questions, looking forward to that, and uh, you can start putting those um, in the Q and A. Um, and while we're kind of populating some questions into uh, into the Q and A, um, I'll actually take the opportunity to to ask the first question. Um, and I have a, a bunch of questions actually, um, but one of the questions that I mean, I think these were two really great presentations in uh, looking at the the question of incarceration in very different contexts, but uh, showing some uh, some real similarities uh, in terms of theme. Um, and I was wondering if if both of you could say a little bit more about some of the the kind of religious context in which imprisonment is taking place, because I think that that seems to be something that uh, is in the background of uh, of both of these. And I'm thinking of the well, as a medievalist, of course, I'm thinking of the the word penitentiary itself, which means like the place of penance, um, implying that crime is somehow coterminous with sin. Um, and uh, uh, in the Middle Ages, um, at the same time that we have 
prisons that are developing uh, for secular purposes. We also have imprisonment being used as um, a kind of adjunct to inquisition uh, in the, the prosecution of, of heresy. Um, and of course, the, the, the very period in the 19th century when Eastern state is, is established as a time of, uh, of religious fervent uh, in the US as well. So I was wondering if both, if, if, if you could speculate a little bit on, um, on this question of how religious ideas are, 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 are somehow shaping the way that, that prisons are developing in each of your time periods. Um, so I, I do the Middle Ages, so I'm gonna go first. Is that okay? <laughs> um, Okay, so I have to say, I think that the church is sort of at the base of everything um, in the Middle Ages. It's important to realize that incarceration actually comes out of the church. Uh, the first prisons that existed were monk cells. I, we might think of them as monk bedrooms, but they called them cells. And whenever the state needed political prisoners imprisoned, they tended to send them over to monasteries. Um, the point behind the whole time in prison is very much to think about what you have done and start the penitential process. Uh, Tony, you mentioned the word penitentiary. I think it is important to note that is a medieval term. It, it comes in, in the late Middle Ages, but it is a medieval term, which I have to say because I think actually um, the idea of sort of looking at prison as rehabilitation is an idea that is very applicable to the medieval period, um, but it doesn't get written about all that much. Um, it is something though, the vast majority of people who spend time in prison, they do not get executed. Instead, they go back and reintegrate into society. But the assumption is people are only willing to allow them back into society, even though they were probably guilty. Um, because they feel that these folks have atoned for their sins. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would say that religion plays a really big role in the medieval prison. Um, um, religion plays a really big role at Eastern State too. Um, this time around though, it's Quakers. So I won't say that Eastern State is a Quaker institution. Um, however, many of the folks who were in that um, Philadelphia society were Quakers. So um, their thought and philosophy really put forth Eastern states. This whole idea of redemption and rehabilitation, that is core to Quaker philosophy. And Eastern State in the beginning was really focused on this idea of privacy and isolation. So yes, everyone was in solitary confinement to um, make the journey more individual focused to stop the spread of disease, but it was also for protection of identity. So um, anytime a prisoner would be um, brought out of their cell for whatever reason, they'd be wearing a hood over their heads to protect the identity of the guards, of the prisoner. Um, all to the point of making redemption possible. So they wouldn't have this layer of shame and humiliation that went along with those public punishments we talked about beforehand. Great, thank you. So we now have a bunch of questions actually popping up in the, the Q&A. Um, so I think what we'll do is just go through them um, in, in, in order. Um, and then if there are any that kind of repeat uh, themes from, from previous questions, uh, we'll, 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 we'll try to combine them. Uh, so the first two questions do sort of address some of the same um, issues about uh, the, 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 the haunted house uh, component of Eastern State Penitentiary historic site. Um, so in class, we consistently speak uh, about the dangers of romanticizing history. In what ways does the haunted house at Eastern State ensure that a historically accurate and, uh, uh, and entertainment experience uh, occur? Uh, and then the, the second question kind of picking up on that uh, as well. Um, what sorts of distinctions do you have to make between education and entertainment to um, alleviate some of the ethical concerns around Eastern State's haunted house? Um, those are excellent questions. And something I want to say is Eastern State, when it was open, was controversial. Um, as a museum, it's also controversial because we do have this haunted house. Um, I will say it is a fight every year of trying to make it as ethical. And I think that we grow every year. 
Um, we have something called the TBTW uh, Sensitivity Summit, which is Tear Behind the Walls Sensitivity Summit. So um, every year, a few folks from within various different communities, so um, Villanova professors, Eastern State employees, people who work in criminal justice reform, people who work in other museums, go through the uh, haunt together and then reconvene in a big, big meeting to talk about what made you uncomfortable. Was there any prison imagery that you saw that portrayed folks in a negative light? And I participated one year and I felt, um, and, and I participated in the sensitivity summit, but I also participated in some of the historical items that we offer during the haunt, which I'll speak to in just a moment because that's a, the whole nother can of worms. But, um, one thing that I noticed through my journey through the haunt was that um, people who were dressed up as monsters, we call them monsters, were calling visitors inmates, which is, first of all, we don't use the word inmate. Um, people who are in prison, um, first of all, like to be known by their name um, or uh, prisoner. Uh, people in prison. So we try to use people first language and we saw the word inmate everywhere throughout the haunted house. So that was one big change we did. Um, but, you know, one of the things that the, the haunted house has not divorced itself from and, and, you know, I don't know the answer here of whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is um, we have a, a VIP experience, which someone, um, if they pay kind of like an exorbitant amount of money, um, uh, if they pay that, then they can get a historic tour um, starting at like 6 p.m. And then we would take them right into the haunted house. So our historic tour would be just history. We really wouldn't go into like salacious or sensational history. Um, but you know, you have people who are expecting a haunted house going on a historic tour. Um, it is very complicated. So um, to sum all of this up, I'll say it's, um, we do have trainings, we do have meetings, but we can always do better. Great, thanks. The next question is, I think, more for Sarah Butler. How do you think that the development of the narrative of the medieval period as a, barbar as a barbaric time of torture came to be? Has anyone pinpointed the start or are there large sources that skewed our vision? Okay, that, that's, <laughs> that's a great question. And honestly, the answer would be so big, I'll probably not get to it all today. But I think that there are um, a lot of elements that are responsible. And I'm not gonna put it all on Hollywood because I actually think that the blame comes from within the scholarly community first. We had some folks writing in the early 20th century who were really keen on art history. And the problem with a lot of the art from the period is it's all art with a message. And the message when it is about uh, the judicial system is we're going to scare you straight. We're going to make sure you don't want to commit crime by showing you ter terrible, absolutely terrible images of torture instruments of executions. And I, I will say like, this is part of Steven Pinker's big problem. He spends a lot of time looking at artwork from the period and it's pretty horrific stuff, but it doesn't align with the actual case materials, which again tells us it's art with a plan. But I think the other problem is quite frankly, the fact that people like to see history as a story of progress. And, you know, unfortunately it's, um, that's, it just doesn't apply in this period um, because the Middle Ages in a lot of ways ended up being way more humane than what we discover in the early modern era. The Reformation just pushed everybody over the edge. Even in England where torture was always forbidden, the English start torturing during the Reformation period. Whipping starts for the very first time in the 16th century. Nobody was whipped in the Middle Ages. Um, and there, there are a lot of things that are suddenly new in the early modern era because they're living during a, a period of crisis. So many people look back and say, well, if it was this bad under Henry VIII, it must have been terrible in the Middle Ages. But we just unfortunately don't have history that fits so neatly into that little linear graph. Great, thanks. Uh, the next question um, is, uh, is one of pedagogy. Um, you you, your presentations did such a great job of pointing out the entertainment factor in easy stories in public history. People in the past used exciting, disgusting punishments. 
in your own teaching and research, how do you balance this with more complicated accounts that uh, you both gave us? Great question. Um, I will say that it is very challenging to try and create this balance. I think something that um, we find even more challenging to do is talking about the racial disparity. So yes, these punishments um, change over time and some are more severe, some aren't, but um, who gets certain punishments is also a really big issue. Um, what we see at Eastern State, and it's kind of incredible because prisons today have still followed this path is that people of color, not only were they um, disproportionately represented inside of Eastern State, but they were typically there for long sentences. They were put in, um, Eastern State was segregated, so they were put in certain blocks um, only on certain levels, and then the other levels were used as punishment blocks. So you can kind of understand the way that they viewed these um, folks when they would come in. And then um, there was job discrepancy as well. People could um, work while they were in prison at Eastern State. I mentioned that beforehand. And um, people of color were given the more manual labor menial tasks. So that for us is the big challenge. So I have to say, I get a lot of students who show up in my classes because they've seen Game of Thrones or Vikings or Rain or something along those that line. And they are expecting gruesomeness. And, you know, there are some good stories out there that certainly um, fit that bill for them. But I think that most students are actually pretty interested to hear the truth. And I find many of the students that I get are really interested to say, okay, well, this happened in season two, episode four of Game of Thrones. Is that legit? Do they really do that in the period? Um, so, I mean, I think there is balance and no matter what, um, the one thing I'm always complaining is I wish Hollywood would actually listen to the historians because honestly, the real history most of the time is far more interesting than what they produce. I mean, having said this, I watch all of these shows too, but, um, you know, I, I think that there is um, a lot of interesting material from the actual history, so they don't need to fabricate it. And certainly one of my pet peeves is the amount of violence against women in a lot of this. I teach a course on medieval women as well, and students seem to come in and assume that anybody could just beat up a wife, perhaps kill her, and that would have been totally fine. I think we're all happy to discover that actually wasn't the case. Um, pop culture is such a, a great point there, Professor Butler. So, um, you know, Prison is in the minds of people always. Um, my my dad loves the show Locked Up Abroad, and he's always talking to me about it. I'm like, Dad, please, I don't care. Um, but you know, people come to Eastern State having watched um, Orange Is the New Black, Wentworth, all of these other things, and you know, those shows do not give an accurate portrayal of what's happening inside of prisons. However, it's an entry point. And you know, it's one way people relate. So as much as I roll my eyes at it, I'm also like, yes, you have some knowledge, let's start. Great, thanks. Um, and for those of you who have posted questions in the chat, I do see those and I'm, 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 I'm sort of going by, by time of posting. So we'll pop over to the ones in the chat uh, when we uh, get through a couple more that are in the Q and A box. So uh, while we go to a, a a, a great social historical question. Um, in the second presentation, it was mentioned that Eastern State held men, women, and children. Were children treated the same as adults in the prison system at the time? Um, great question. I think that's something we continuously do more research on. Um, the biggest difference was in race. So children of color would typically be sent to Eastern State. Um, white boys were typically sent to reformatory schools. So Eastern State sits in Fairmount Park. Um, two blocks up from Eastern State is Girard College. That is where um, white male children would go if they had committed the same crime as a black male child would have done. Um, Eastern State's youngest prisoner was 11 years old. 
Um, she was convicted of arson, though um, I have my doubts. Um, her name was Mary Ash. She um, was an orphan. She did not have a home, so she's homeless. Um, if she started a fire, it was for warmth. Um, but this is also like the 1870s. So it's like very hard for me to like find that kind of evidence and say that, but we like to complicate narratives. So that's, that's the story I would share. And I do think it's interesting um, that both of you have pointed out the, the way in which prisons operate as places of social differentiation, uh, according to class, um, that, that seems to be something that cuts across the entire history of uh, of incarceration. Um, Can I just so pop in and say one thing, just because I think the children thing is really interesting. So for the medieval period, there's this definite idea that, you know, we're not supposed to hold children accountable before the age where they know the difference between right and wrong, etc. But they usually see 12 as sort of the age for children. Um, so, you know, they're not going to toss you in prison if you are younger than that. However, um, a lot of families couldn't survive without their husbands. So what we actually discover is with medieval prisons, a lot of men brought their wives and children into prison to stay with them because otherwise they weren't going to be able to eat. That's fascinating. Um, so we have another question about Eastern State uh, Penitentiary um, in the Q&A box. How many visitors would you guess um, that come to the haunted house at Eastern State um, have come to a normal tour as well? How does this dynamic make you feel? Um. <laughs> I, I wish our daytime numbers reflected our nighttime numbers. Um, we most definitely more people go to the haunted house than to the historic site. I will say though that particularly now that we are not doing the haunted house, people are showing up and saying, yeah, I went in here for the haunted house and I was just so interested. So we do give people discounted tickets for the um, museum if they have already purchased um, a ticket for the haunt. Um, we also do uh, double headers as a way to encourage people to come to the museum. But um, how does that make me feel? Um, you know, it makes me question my own personal like morals and ethics of, um, you know, is this something that Eastern State should be doing? I recognize that this is our biggest fundraiser. We can't really exist as a museum if we don't do this. Um, but like, like how do, how do you really go, like as a human, how do you really go through that? So I, I would say that it's um, something that I struggle with and the balance is not much of a balance, but usually in the time of fall, it's, it's more like a, like a this kind of thing if that is an answer at all. So I think we'll go over to a question that's in the chat box, um, one that I think both of you can, can take up. Um, I realize that the move toward uh, equity and social, race, social slash racial justice has shifted some of the focus toward giving voice to the incarcerated and their families. And I'm not arguing that this isn't a necessary step for our growth as a society. However, I'm curious about how you remain sensitive to the victims of crime and their families during this evolution in the public dialogue about justice, especially for more recent events where there isn't a cushion uh, of time. I have to say, I never, ever, ever deal with recent events. This <laughs> tends to be the easier part. Well, that's not entirely true. I guess I do sometimes in my blog when I'm trying to make some of my history relevant to people. Um, and I, I think that it is a very difficult issue to deal with, um, especially since often I'm excited about the modern occurrences in part because it brings my history into the present. Um, but I, I do think it's important to be very sensitive to all of this. Um, when I'm teaching courses about crime in the Middle Ages, I'm very aware that some of my students may have been in prison or um, may have a family member in prison. I actually grew up in Kingston, Ontario, which is in Canada, so most of you won't have heard of it, but there are seven prisons in Kingston. So believe it or not, there's seven prisons in a university. So everybody I went to school with, their parents were either prison guards or professors. Um, it was a rather odd experience. But I do think that some of that got me very accustomed to trying to be quite diplomatic when discussing this and realizing that everybody I'm talking about, even though they've often been dead a very long time, they're real people. These are real life experiences. And 
uh, it, it can be very distressing stuff to read. Yeah, um, this in this question, the word victim stands out to me because um, it's such a loaded word. And I think when it comes to crime and incarceration, there are more victims than just um, what we typically think about. Um, knowing Philadelphia and knowing that the the educational the, the educational and economic opportunities are not equal across the city um, there are a lot of folks who live in poverty who live below poverty lines um, are over incarcerated they are over policed um, and they sometimes commit crimes where there are victims um, I consider that them being a victim of a system too and so, you know, you really do have a lot of things to juggle. Like you have a, a crime that was committed where someone was um, victimized, was injured, but then you also have someone who, if they had access to um, the proper opportunities, um, they might not have gone down that road. So I always encourage folks to really think about the, the root cause of crime and go from there. Um, that being said, if someone does have lived experience, either being in prison or being a victim, you hold space for that person um, regardless. Um, and many times it has come up on my tours and programs. And so just thanking folks for sharing and saying that is definitely a perspective people have and they, and they should have because it's their own lived experience. So just really acknowledging it and validating that they went through that, even if you don't agree or, um, you know, don't agree on either side, whichever side. Thank you. Um, so this is a question specifically for Sarah Butler. Uh, the disconnect between the popular images of the medieval period and the history is always so interesting. And I'm wondering if perhaps we should talk more about the barbarous early modern period. Yes, we should. Um, then the <laughs> then the barbarous medieval period. What do you see as the significance of the development of the state in the early modern period and the focus on social control for practices of punishment, some of those um, public punishments that Sam described? Okay, I have to warn you in advance, my best friend is an early modernist and would be very upset if I started referring to the barbarous early modern era. I can't go there. Um, I, I guess, I mean, this is a really great question. There is an incredible disconnect. I think one of the big problems out there in society is the Middle Ages is such a big amorphous era that people don't really remember what it encapsulates. And it's often just sort of shoved together with the early modern. So people don't know which is which. I don't know how many times I've been to museums where they talk about these medieval torture instruments because it's barbaric, so it must be medieval, but they're really early modern. Um, the early modern era is a tough era. I mean, it's the witch craze era. We can't get away from that. And the witch craze in particular, like all of those rules I talked about applying to torture, they threw all of those out the window when it comes to the witch craze. Um, so it's, it's a rough period. And I certainly do think that the development of a more authoritarian leaning state throughout the early modern period is really key to all of this. Um, however, I, I bristle at the idea of moving too much in that direction because I think some recent scholars have started doing that. And honestly, I hesitate to give too much power to the state. Um, people like Matthew Lockwood, for example, in his latest book on um, the inquest, has tried to argue that the state becomes like a surveillance state in the early modern period. You know, they just didn't have that kind of resources in the early modern era either. Um, we, I think people honestly have just watched too many sci-fi movies and we're trying to project something more interesting on the period that actually exists. But um, particularly with the English state, which is what I look at, they're cheap. They're always trying to run government in the cheapest way possible, which means you're just never really going to know what's going on well enough to run a surveillance state. Just a thought. Thanks. Um, so the next question is for uh, Samantha Hunter. Um, did Eastern State keep its idealistic reform mission? How did it change over time? That's I thought I was thinking that when you were presenting that this the history of this prison goes all the way up to what, 1971, I think, or, or something like that. Um, how long did it stay as a, a kind of reform-oriented institution? Um, 
officially the whole 142 <laughs> years. Um, but I would argue that as soon as the prison opened, there were people who upheld the mission and then there were people who didn't. Um, about six years into the prison opening, so 1834, there was a huge grand jury investigation um, and uh, of the prison. And one of the things, one of the charges that came out was against the, the warden for cruel and unusual punishment. Eastern State was built like on Quaker philosophy, people should be treated uh, treated humanely. This is a humane alternative. And one prisoner died um, while he was in an iron gag. Um, from interviews that they did at the time and research that they did at the time, this particular person, his name was Matthias McComsey, he had been put in the iron gag at least 20 other times. So this is six years into this brand new institution. So did it ever exist? I think it depends on the person. Um, I do think that there were some folks, some prison administrators who did a, a good job. They really tried. Um, but when you exist in a system that is built on inequalities and injustices, it's hard to do a good job even in those circumstances. Uh, just in the interest of time, I think I'm going to try to combine the next two questions that are in the Q&A because I think they both actually cover some interesting similar territory. Um, so putting these two questions together, um, do you see a relationship between the way that incarceration was looked at in each of your, your, your periods and what we have today, which is these very long sentences that are served, um, uh, including life sentences? And then are there ways in which um, uh, what we see in uh, in imprisonment in the past can be used to uh, help us rethink prisons today. Well, I will say one thing I actually agree with with my history is I don't really see the point in these extremely long periods of incarceration, uh, especially when I'm not terribly convinced that today there is much of an attempt at rehabilitation that is going on in the 20 years or whatever some people can sit in prison. Um, certainly in the medieval period, there were people who could end up uh, in prison a while, either because someone forgot they were there, which unfortunately happens every now and then, um, or because they were monks or priests and the church had decided they did something terrible and we're going to put them in prison for a long time. Um, so, I mean, there is that idea there that a solitary confinement of an extended period, um, as Ms. Hunter has discussed, could be really useful, um, again, in terms of atoning for one's sin. But, you know, all of this was focused on the afterlife, and their approach was life can be miserable. That's totally fine, because you're just worried about the impact later on. Today, I prefer to think about this might be our only shot. So let's have some enjoyment while this is going on, which is why I would certainly argue shorter prison sentences might be useful at times. Um, I'll go back to the question that asked about the idyllic mission. Um, I think that that mission and the founders believed in like the possibility of change and believed in redemption. Um, I think that if that was evident in our criminal justice system today, um, you wouldn't have people who are spending um, decades of their life in prison. You wouldn't have such high recidivism rates. Um, that's why there is such a high population, um, longer sentences and recidivism. And recidivism is not just committing more crime. More often than not, it's um, by violating something of parole, which parole changes for every individual. So if like a focus on the individual that change is possible, but also asking, is incarceration the answer to all crimes? And I don't think so, but that's the conversation I want to have. Uh, this is another question for, uh, for, for Ms. Hunter. Um, I have a question about Eastern State. You spoke about how solitary confinement was part of a new philosophy that focused on rehabilitation and reform. What other ways was this philosophy pursued? Are there instances where Eastern State abandoned this new philosophy uh, of punishment? Uh, oh, yeah, um, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so um, the, the, the 
big alarm here is solitary confinement was used for everybody. Um, it was the catalyst for change. And then in 1913, they abandoned that system. And instead, solitary was confinement was used as the, the primary form of punishment. Um, we do know that other punishment devices were used at the prison. Um, we know that the iron gag, Matthias McComsey died in that. Um, they also used something called the tranquilizing chair, strapping someone to a chair, beating them in it. Um, we know that they used ice baths, um, cat and tails. They used all of these things. Um, so again, did they ever have this progressive view? I question that all the time. Uh, I'm going to go back to the Q&A for, uh, for Professor Butler. <laughs> uh, what happened to prisoners in the medieval period if they could not afford prison? Charity. Um, so it's a really, I mean, this is the thing. It's utterly ridiculous. And I've always thought the best thing to say would be when they ask for those entrance fees. Oh, well, sorry, I forgot my wallet. Maybe another day. Um, but no, they still put you in there and they just add it to your tab of everything that you owe. And it just keeps going up and up until you hope that someone is charitable enough and helps you out. Um, I will say one of the things that's really important, it was an extraordinarily Catholic society, uh, feeding prisoners and helping prisoners, helping the poor. These are part of the seven works of mercy. So people took this stuff seriously. And there are a lot of um, deathbed bequests to prisoners to help them out. Um, I also think that the time in prison was a great opportunity for your family to go to someone in town and negotiate and find a way to be in debt to somebody else who will pay off your fines so you can eventually get out. We do occasionally find that the king takes mercy on the poor and lets them out. Um, and it's actually surprising. There've been a couple of studies recently on deaths in prison, and it really seems like there weren't that many people who died in prison in the Middle Ages, which you would think there'd be a lot more. Um, and I'm still left sort of questioning if this is this missing records or, I, it's a hard one to figure out. Um, but still, it, it does suggest that most people did eventually get out. It just, it was a bad situation. And um, can I also add that that was reminded me of, you know, how prisons run today. So people also pay for their incarceration today. One of the most common misconceptions I hear is, well, you know, um, people commit crimes to get three hots and a cot, right? Three meals and a place to sleep, which like, first of all, that says more about American society that someone's willing to go to prison to get those things. Um, but um, the idea that people in prison receive anything for free is not true, right? They have to pay for healthcare. They have to pay for subscriptions. Um, they might be given food, but more often than not, um, prisoners are substituting their diet um, from prison commissary. So commissary is like a, like a store shop where they can purchase um, a lot of different things like toothpaste, toothbrushes, um, shampoo, conditioner. Um, I actually have a family member who's incarcerated right now. He asked for sweatpants. Um, my mom was just gonna go and buy him a pair of sweatpants, but he's like, no, I, I, I can't, I need to buy them from the store. Um, and so my mother had to give him money so he could buy um, the sweatpants in the store. But also um, something that has been in the news recently is Florida. So Florida within the past couple of years gave um, returning citizens, so people who have served out their sentences, um, the right to vote back. And I mean, this is something that like, um, you know, incarcerated people are disenfranchised all across the country, but Florida had like over a million people who were not able to vote anymore because they had that on their record. And ever since the, the folks of Florida voted for that, um, the, the government of Florida tried to find ways of making that not possible. And one was, well, okay, if you want to vote, you have to pay off all your fines. And a person racks up the fines when they're in prison. And it's been in the news recently because Michael Bloomberg actually paid off a bunch of people's um, fines and now they're able to vote, which, you know, however you feel about him, at least he's using some of his money for good. Okay, I just have to say, 
I love the Middle Ages, but I find it so depressing when medieval experiences are still happening in the world around us. That is so sleazy. Uh, so I think we'll take the, the, there's another question in the chat box um, about Eastern states. So this is for uh, Samantha Hunter. Um, my class will be talking more about how museums do civic engagement. Can you speak more about Eastern states approach to using history to speak to contemporary issues around mass incarceration, both in your standing exhibition and in your programming? Yeah, so um, that is probably our biggest educational push since about 2012. Um, before then, so the museum opened up in 1994. Before then, we were just trying to get people in the door telling the history about Eastern State. But come 2012, it was, all right, well, we need to start talking about what's happening now because we're seeing so many people in prison. Um, we have two exhibits on site right now. Um, one we have lovingly referred to as the big graph because it is a giant, 16 foot metal bar graph out on our baseball field that has um, statistics on there of incarceration rates over time, how the United States stacks up to other countries, which, you know, spoiler alert, we're at the top and no country's really near us, and then how it breaks down by race. Um, but statistics and numbers are kind of cold. So we have our Prisons Today exhibit, which um, you can explore on our website. Um, and that puts a face to these gigantic numbers that we see. Um, some of the information that you'll come across in that exhibit is incarceration is a choice. There are other countries who think that um, if a person has a substance abuse problem, the best way to treat them is not through prison, it's through rehab. Um, even if someone is in prison, it might not look the way that it looks right now. Um, we find out that white folks and black folks um, commit drug crimes at the same similar rate, yet black folks are more than likely to be incarcerated for those same crimes than a white person. Um, there is one of my favorite parts of the exhibit talks about um, confessions. Um, we did this thing for a while where people who visited the site, we asked them to write down a confession and then we would put them up with confessions from people who are in prison. And then we would have our visitors try to decide who was who. And then there's two buttons you can click. You can click the one that says visitors to Eastern state and you see a whole bunch. One talks about, and you know, these person, these people, they shared it. Um, voluntarily, um, how they stole money from a student's fund. And every time this gets one, it gets people, they're like, oh, well, that's someone in prison. No, it's not. Um, so just trying to complicate narratives. But in our other additional educational programming that is not in exhibit form, um, for instance, like I just created a program called Defining Justice. It's a workshop that um, gets to the, the crux of the criminal justice system, which is the word justice there. Um, we talk about how just the language we use can set people up for success or failure. So if we're calling it the criminal justice system, what are assumptions you've already made? about people involved in there, right? That they're guilty of a crime, that they are dangerous, they're this, they are that. Um, when you set someone up with those um, connotations, with that language, um, it's not meant for success. And so we, we tackle issues like that. Um, honestly, though, I think that our job will never be done interpreting contemporary issues. And so I, I always like to say, if you wanna talk about that with your class, shoot me an email and we can talk about it. I can um, show, give you all the resources that I have and you might need. Great, thanks. Um, I'm gonna, since we're running a little bit uh, close to the end of time here, um, I'm gonna pick a few things out of the, the, the Q&A box, uh, particularly questions that I think can be combined. So apologies to anybody whose questions I'm skipping over. Um, but there are a couple of questions for Professor Butler about um, differences between medieval justice and modern justice. Um, the first question, uh, you pointed out how torture was not meant as a form of punishment uh, in medieval times. However, as Sam Hunter mentioned, punishment was performed to be um, everlasting and publicized at Eastern, Eastern State Penitentiary. So so I was wondering um, where you think this form of thinking was changed and uh, why people are accepting of this change rather than getting outraged. And then I think that's actually uh, very closely linked to this question um, about um, 
it says that you were mentioned how you mentioned how jailers did not carry weapons and relied on the honor system from prisoners. When did it start to become the norm for jailers to be armed around prisoners? I think both of those questions get at sort of the way in which medieval um, medieval justice was different from 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 contemporary justice. Okay, both really really good questions. And um, again, I. I I'm feeling like a bad person here because I, I'm making a bad guy out of the early modern era. Um, but a lot of rough things do happen when you suddenly have the witch hunts that are sort of occupying people's minds and changing the way they're dealing with things. And, you know, the witch hunt was also going on at the same time as the Reformation, which in many people's minds would be a major heresy scare. Um, and heresy, witchcraft, it's all tied together. I do think that we have a normalization of torture taking place during this period because it was used on witches. It was also used for secret Catholics or secret Protestants, depending on where we are talking. Um, but certainly in the English scenario, you see torture coming in primarily to deal with people who they think might be secret Catholics. And I think it only takes a little bit of dabble until people start to break down some of the barriers. It's really funny throughout the Middle Ages, um, the English are so superior saying, we don't torture like the French do, they're barbaric. And then what happens in the early modern era? Um, I also think that in the early modern era, they start having more ideas about how to deal with petty crime. Um, and a lot of that petty crime, you know, it probably was easier to deal with it in a more corporal punishment fashion than having people sent to prison for a few days. There certainly was a recognition that um, prison is problematic because someone might get in and rack up the expenses and they'd far rather just be publicly whipped. So I think some of the ideas start changing in there. Um, with weapons, I am not an expert on this, but honestly, it seems to me that the change over to serious weaponry is a 20th century innovation. Um, I'm going to defer to Sam Hunter on this one. Um, I, I really don't know. Um, it's a very different attitude, though, and throughout the early modern period, they, they're not using weaponry as well, because the assumption is you bring in a weapon, it's just going to get used by a prisoner to beat one of the prison guards. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, at Eastern State, most guards would have had a billy club or the cat and nine tails. Um, it doesn't change until the turn of the 20th century. A specific year is hard to give, but um, a lot of changes come to the prison around the 1920s. Um, so I would say it was probably, it predates that just a little bit. And the only people who would have been armed were guards that were in guard towers above ground. So um, because they didn't want prisoners to overpower somebody and then now have an armed weapon. So like um, there were five, six, six high, um, high guard towers. So only potentially like 20 people at one time. Great. Um, I have to, I just have to ask this question because I do think it's such a fascinating one um, and, uh, and, and brings together the medieval and the, the Middle Ages plus the, 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 the incredible architecture of Eastern State Penitentiary. So uh, the question is Eastern State Penitentiary was progressive at the time for its architectural features such as isolated cells. What can the architecture of medieval structures tell us about uh, prisons? Of Sorry, I actually misread that question at first because so can I reframe it? Because I also would like to hear from, 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 from uh, Samantha Hunter why the prison Eastern State Penitentiary was built as a medieval prison if it was supposed to be very progressive. So maybe we can combine these two. Why is Eastern State Penitentiary built the way that it was? And then what do medieval prisons say uh, in their architecture about the purposes of prisons or the role of prison in society? Sam, did you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Oh. You can go first. You can go first. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so um, most medieval prisons, unfortunately, don't exist anymore, which is very frustrating, but they all kind of ended up falling apart. Um, but early on, certainly, most of them ended up being in the only fortifications that existed, which usually was part of a castle, 
because castles were fortified and big and you know they've got some room that you can use um, or gates city gates or in the city walls um, you have a lot of them that were built into the walls because again it's some of the only fortifications we have around generally that means though that most medieval prisons were quite small they couldn't actually handle that many people um, Sam Hunter the image that you used of Newgate was the rebuilt Newgate much later um, the medieval Newgate I mean you could fit like 80 people in there if you were really squeezing. Um, so <laughs> that's one of the problems with the medieval ones. And I'll also say they didn't have um, individual rooms often. Um, you know, you'd have individual rooms for the rich people, but then the rest of them were just throwing them in together, which is another reason not to give them weapons. Who knows what'll happen. Um, so two things. <laughs> one, um, everything, medieval about eastern state is fake so the outside of the prison is meant to look like a castle but um the parapets are too shallow for anyone to stand in um the arrow slit windows that are outside do not go through it was all just a facade so it was to be intimidating to be scary um because there was this perception even in the um 1780s 1790s that the medieval times were just dangerous and scary um so a really great point i'm so glad you said that um but also the architecture of eastern state um, the prison was built on something called a radial plan. So it looks like a wagon wheel on its side. This design was, I can't even tell you how influential it was. It was copied over 300 times across the world. There's a, a prison, a hospital, or a school that looks like Eastern State literally everywhere. My high school looked like it. So once I started working at Eastern State, you can imagine I was like, oh, this is very strange. But the architecture of schools and prisons are too close for comfort sometimes. Great, thank you. That was, that was fascinating. Um, well, we're almost at the end of uh, the, the, uh, the, the period here. Um, and I know that Professor Drummond had some things that she wanted to announce at the end. But I did want, there's one question here that I uh, would like both of you to talk about just because it's a great history student question and programs for his, for history students. Uh, of course, we're all students at LMU, but uh, specifically for, for history students. And that is about sources. Um, so the question is, I'm guessing that most accounts from inside prisons are very rare, uh, but have either of you encountered documents or accounts of prison life from people who are in prison? So what's the source base from which you're working uh, in looking at prisons? Um, I end up looking at a lot of records of people who are complaining about their time in prison. Um, so they are actually in prison dictating a letter to the chancellor um, asking the king for assistance in getting out of prison. Um, some of these are really dramatic because the more dramatic the plea, the better. So pretty much everybody is on the verge of death. And unless the king does something immediately, they are going to expire. Um, but at the same time, I mean, some of these records are really useful because they give me a sense of an abuse of the prison experience, which honestly is the only way to figure out what was actually normal from this period, um, because nowhere is it described what is acceptable in terms of prison conditions. So you have to figure out from the prisoners when they say, well, this is unacceptable. So they're very fun records. Um, my favorite question to ask while working is what's your source? Um, because we have, so many different sources out there and they evolve over time, which I know sounds strange, but um, a lot of what, so um, we have something that we train all of our educators, all of our staff on. It's a, a book that came out in 1994, right when the historic site opened. It's called The Crucible of Good Intentions. And um, we give that to everybody, but there are so many inaccuracies in there, like, you know, 20 some years later that we now know of. But um, primarily our sources come from the warden's daily journals. Um, some wardens were great at keeping records. Some wardens were not. Um, one warden in particular, he reminds me so much of Donald Trump, the way that he writes about people, it, it, it is almost funny, but he was meticulous in his um, like date keeping. He talks about everybody, everything that comes into the prison. And then you have people who wrote, 
this person came in today and then that was it. Um, so we have warden's daily journals, we have annual reports, we do have like the grand jury investigations, there were four at the prison, so <laughs> a lot. Um, but I think one thing that um, Professor Butler I have that um, I know you don't is that some people are still alive today that were incarcerated at Eastern State. So we have oral histories. Um, for a very long time, we also had something called Alumni Weekend where um, former employees and residents of Eastern State come and talk about their lived experiences. Um, I've also met folks who are still in prison that were at Eastern State. So um, we use their oral histories. You have to take everything with a grain of salt with um, you know that person's particular lived experience. And also it's been 20, 30 years. But you know, that's still a source. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we're almost, again, it's, it's, it's actually 3.30 now. So uh, I wanted to first apologize to anybody whose questions we didn't get to. This would be the point if we were in person that we would invite you to come up and talk to the speakers and have some pizza. Um, we owe you pizza um, and uh, we, 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 we owe our speakers a, a nice visit to Los Angeles uh, as well. But I'd like to thank both uh, Samantha Hunter and Sarah Butler for coming with us today, um, being with us today. And um, again, we can't, uh, we, we can, we can, you can imagine, you could, you could just, in, you know, try to imagine the thunderous applause you would be hearing if you were in our village um, in University Hall. So thank you. And I would just like to add my thanks to you both um, for zooming in today and taking time out of your days to, to be with us. This was a phenomenal discussion and um, there's just so much more that we could talk about and so many more questions and comments. Uh, uh, it's a shame that we have to bring it to a close, but these sorts of webinars always do have to come to a close. And I, I want to also thank Tony um, for serving as such a great moderator um, uh, for our, our panel discussion today. Um, to the students out there, from my students, I will see you in class on Wednesday, but then for students and um, everyone out there uh, who's, who's watching, um, there will be our, our next event is an event we're co-sponsoring with the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. That is Wednesday, October 28th, so in about a week and a half time, um, and it is um, it's a, a program with the historian Kathleen Cahill uh, and the political scientist uh, Shia Crowder, who is new here at LMU. And they will be talking about the centennial um, of uh, women's suffrage. Uh, so right in advance of the, the election, we'll have a, a big program on women's suffrage. And that's going to be at 2.20 on Wednesday, uh, October 28th. And we hope that you'll be able to join us uh, then. And thank you again. We're very much appreciated. Uh, thanks to all of you out there as well.